desk. Uh, I'm at work right now. Uh, but uh, I mean, I guess from my perspective, I kind of want to let uh, Shadia kind of shine and kind of, uh, I would say, kind of lead the conversation. I will kind of chime in where needed. But um, I do um, feel it's important that everybody kind of has the opportunity to kind of weigh in, maybe express kind of uh, some things that they can relate to, maybe some things that maybe triggered intriguing thoughts, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I'm just ready to kind of hear what everybody has to say and talk about. So I kind of just uh, leave it to you, Shadia, to kind of run the program. Awesome, thank you, Ms. Michaela. Thank you, Dr. Brown. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for participating in this one book discussion. My name is Shadia Saleh. I am a third year medical student here at the University of Kansas. Um, and this book has particular, I'm excited to facilitate this discussion um, and to help us, you know, talk about this book, uh, um, particularly because I'm a native of Newark, New Jersey. I grew up in Newark, New Jersey. Um, I moved here from Newark, New Jersey to attend medical school. Um, and so for me, while I was reading this book, um, a lot of the patient stories and circumstances and obstacles and hurdles that the patients and other individuals in the book faced uh, were things that I could directly relate to or understand directly. Um, a lot of the locations were things that I could just innately uh, imagine just from having the background of living in Newark. Um, however, I know that uh, this book has many stories and concepts that are relatable for many of us here today, uh, whether directly or indirectly. And so with that, I would really like to encourage an organic conversation, an inclusive conversation where everyone is comfortable to uh, participate. And um, I'd just like to open up this discussion by asking you all uh, what patient stories um, and, and uh, uh, I guess dilemmas faced by the patients or other individuals in the book resonated most strongly with you. And this is an You're muted, Shadia. And this You're is, muted, Shadia. thank you so much. This is an open forum. And so I just wanted to encourage everyone, you can unmute yourself and participate or chime in as like, you know, a commentary to what someone else has said. This is Suzanne Hunt, I'm in biostatistics. Um, I was just, I have always been grateful that I've had insurance where I've worked. I can't imagine not having insurance and having to make decisions about, you know, is this bad enough to go see a doctor? What if it costs money? I, yeah, I can't imagine having to make those decisions. I also thought, I mean, I liked a lot of the stories, but threading them all together. Oh, I'm Kim Hewitt. I'm um, in community relations at the University of Kansas Medical Center um, campus at in KCK. And, um, I feel like tying it all together is just this, you know, another example, as if we need another example, that where you live determines your health and your happiness and your wealth. So I do think besides access to health, it's we need to create opportunities for wealth in communities that are underinsured um, and, and uninsured. Piggybacking on that, I think something uh, interesting to note when having those conversations or when pivoting to those conversations is that there have been studies that show that um, underrepresented minorities, particularly Black and Latino individuals in America, um, even if they have means, financial means, if they live in certain communities, they also have um, lower uh, or, or, or uh, they, they also exhibit disparities in health outcomes compared to their white counterparts. I, um, I'm Karen Houston Howell, and I'm from Counseling and Ed Support at KUMED. And um, I found from chapter one that he, it was just so strongly presented um, by the Marvin Gaye lyrics, the brother, brother, brother. Um, I just thought that was 
just a very impactful way to start the entire book. And I wondered how hard it had to be to live in a neighborhood where you knew your patients that were coming in and people who were coming in with, you know, who had been shot or were dying or, you know, um, I, that, that really resonated with me. And I would think that would be a really impossible task almost. That was one that I had as well, Karen. My name is Barb Manning. I'm in the um, Institute for Community Engagement for the Key Program, um, and I just the the fact that you ran in a in a similar circle <laughs> as well, and then you know had shifted that into the professional world um, was really interesting. I mean, just to see it from a different perspective, and you know how we are we're we're challenged to treat people equally, but yet you, there's a different lens that comes into that when you've had an association, not that it's right or wrong, I don't mean it that way at all, but there's just a different lens of how you separate that personal and professional side of it. Um, and I, I just thought you did a fantastic job of um, really creating the story and, and, and inviting the reader really into your world. So kudos to you, Dr. Brown. It was, it was very, very enlightening. So Shadi, I know um, Newark means a, a lot to you growing up there. Um, uh, what are your thoughts? I mean, have you thought about if you were to go back and work at Beth, et cetera, mm -hmm. potentially seeing some of your friends or people that you may have known um, mm -hmm. in, that, in, in the same capacity as he kind of discussed, like with Spike and the various individuals that he had the opportunity to discuss in the book. What are your thoughts about that? Well, you know, I do, um, as a as a future physician, I do plan on serving the underserved. Um, growing up in New York, New Jersey, and having faced certain uh, socioeconomic disadvantages and other educational disadvantages definitely has made me aware of and sensitive to um, the hurdles that many of these people cannot overcome just by the way of um, uh, structural obstacles. Um, it's interesting that you ask that because I actually have uh, childhood classmates who have had mm, really disastrous outcomes. Unfortunately, someone that I went to school with in primary school is now in uh, in prison for life for murder. Um, you know, and I have other classmates who had similar dreams to me, who really were they were as as like as smart as I was as a child, um, maybe sometimes even smarter than I was. Um, and there's really no difference between myself and some of these individuals, but sometimes it comes down to having certain supports um, or seeking the right resources and, um, you know, uh, being able to succeed and overcome obstacles. Um, I would say though, that most of the individuals that I have spoken with uh, that are my age, who are adults now living in Newark, um, although a lot of them don't have uh, maybe the life outcomes that someone, for example, myself would have, um, a lot of them are actually, that I've uh, reached out to or have spoken with are actually proud of and surprised um, in, in a happy way that I'm in medical school. Um, and a lot of them have been encouraging actually. So that is... Uh, you got muted again. Oh, sorry about that. I'm I'm sure Dr. Davis had had some experiences, but they were not um, noted at least within the, uh, you know, within this book. So. Gotcha. Anybody else with any thoughts? Any chapters that kind of just stick out to anybody else who is in the chat? Um, hi, my name is Rachel Reynolds. I'm an occupational therapy student um, at KU Med. Um, I just really appreciated throughout the entire book um, how at the end of each chapter it highlighted um, on facts or resources um, or information that was pertinent to the chapter that you're just reading. I feel like a lot of the times when we're in healthcare, um, there's the language that we use or um, certain diagnoses or diagnoses that um, we just kind of may know about. And the other 
populations um, that we're serving or even those that are reading this book um, may not have information on. So being able to read about his experiences um, with, for instance, the lung cancer, throat cancer, and then at the end of the chapter, being able to see um, different health signs um, or where to get help or what to do to try to limit um, the exposure to potentially getting cancer. I just thought that that was a great way to sum up chapters. So no matter what educational level you have, um, experience in the healthcare, um, where you live, you have some sort of information um, to relate to, to um, learn from. So um, I really appreciated that after each chapter. Uh, Rachel, thank you for attending. Was there any particular chapter and uh, some subsequent uh, medical information that you found to be most helpful or that you learned from the most? Um, overall, I think I, relating from occupational therapy to the med field. Um, I didn't have any rotations um, in like acute care or the emergency department. Um, so I think kind of learning the interprofessional side of it or seeing what the doctors may be doing in this kind of setting um, was really informational to me um, because I don't have that same kind of exposure in the field that I'm learning right now. Um, but also kind of taking the information that he has had um, and trying to make ties to it to maybe what I would see um, in the future as an occupational therapist or serving um, populations or underserved populations. Um, so kind of making those little ties. I had a rotation at the pro bono clinic for JSTART. So um, doing like telehealth through there and serving that um, population who doesn't have insurance um, and providing them OT services. So trying to make those ties between what he, um, his experiences as an MD and growing up and then um, to what I've been learning in school and some of the rotations I've had um, crossing those over um, was like the biggest part that I was learning from and reflecting throughout the book. And I think that's very important. I mean, you know, for me, um, me being a hospitalist or internal medicine physician, I think that's one of the things that I try to do uh, with all of my patients and family. I mean, you really, really have to make our language plain. Um, I think you get outcomes are improved, et cetera, patient participation, um, being more compliant when they feel as though, number one, they can understand what you're saying. You're not talking down to them, et cetera. And I think that's kind of what he also highlighted in various chapters as well is, you know, him trying to relate to the patient, whether it be, you know, Deborah and her situation with, uh, um, you know, domestic abuse, et cetera. I found that was kind of the key throughout most of his, um, his chapters that no matter what the topic or the issue at hand was in regards to that patient he was treating, he often tried to connect with them, not only from a medical standpoint, but a personal standpoint, and then try to correlate that in such a way that the patient would understand. Now, you don't always get the outcomes, you know, that you want. And being in the emergency room, sometimes, as he showed, uh, they definitely do have the mortality, the morbidity, and a lot of the trauma that goes along with it. But, uh, but I do agree that's very important that... Um, you have to be able to meet the patient, you know, at their level a lot of times to increase the chances that the outcome you want in whatever disease process you're taking care of, that they will be more inclined to participate, do what they need to do, et cetera. We got any medical school students out there? Are you all alone, Shadia? Is a medical school student out there? Hey, uh, my name is Kai Simmons. I'm a fourth year medical student. Um, you know, there's a lot of discussion that came up that um, you, know, you, you guys bring up a great point in the fact that he tries to, you know, number one, bring his, um, I guess, like shop talk or when he's talking to the patient kind of down to their level. I um, mean, you know, there's a different dialect when you grow up in neighborhoods that are underserved, um, you know, myself, Shadia included. Um, you know, you, you kind of speak differently when you're, when you're talking to people who you grew up with, who you might be more comfortable with. And that kind of helps build a rapport, uh, the patient-physician relationship. 
Um, you know, Rochelle brought up a great point as well in that after each chapter, there is some instruction and a little bit further information on um, some actionable items, how you can um, take some of these lessons that were, um, you know, offered in the book and, and, you know, like maybe do something to them or some tangible information that uh, you could either learn from or help pass on. So I think like each one of those things are uh, impactful and, you know, something that, you know, each one of us can take and then, you know, model and, and try to um, contribute to addressing the disparities. Thank you so much, Kai, my fellow med student here at uh, the discussion. We appreciate your comment. Just so you know, Shadia, there's no questions in the chat. So if you have another one you want to bring up, that now might be a great time. I guess like to kind of piggyback on all that, I'm, my name is Daniel. I'm an occupational therapy student at the University of Kansas Medical Center. Uh, <clears throat> I'm actually uh, in Montana. Um, so a little bit of a different underserved uh, population here in uh, rural America. Um, but I, I do think what you guys were talking about, how communicating to those, to those patients, um, I, my rotations were in acute care, um, working closely with hospitalists. Um, but I never really had that conversation with, with any patients where the, I may have miscommunicated um, and believed this patient to live and they actually passed. And I never had that kind of conversation with the caregiver. Um, so I, I think that's just one thing that I, I really picked up from this book. I think that was in uh, Killing Us Softly um, chapter. And it was just learning learning to communicate with patients and being able to actually take your time with your communication and not say something that you know can be interpreted differently or wrongly um especially with those uh communities that um you know may not have that sort of medical um terminology or, or competence And I think, um, thank you for your comment. I think there's something to be said about having exposure, frequent exposure to people of certain communities to understand how they are communicating. For example, I had a patient who, it was a pediatric patient. And when the uh, healthcare provider had asked a question, the uh, healthcare provider essentially thought the patient was denying like substance use. Whereas I caught that that patient said, no, not for real which subsequently I, I told that provider, I think the patient was saying, no, not really, as in, yes, sometimes I use substances. So I think, um, you know, we can enhance how we, uh, I guess overall we can enhance how um, our ability to understand where a patient is coming from and how they communicate um, just from, from frequent exposure um, to those kinds of people and how they communicate. I do have another question for you all. Um, I wanted to know, um, I want to, would like to know if there were any patient stories that were presented in a way that um, you really had an aha realization. There might be concepts that we've heard frequently, but that really hit home once, you know, we have a, a way of connecting with or identifying with that concept through, a, you know, a, a personal story or in this case, a patient story. I think I had a little bit of an aha moment um, with the story about the nurse who was pregnant and um, her husband called an ambulance and the ambulance didn't show and he had to take her to the hospital and she passed and so did her newborn baby. And um, it's just an impossibility. It just seems impossible to me that somebody needing help wouldn't get the help they need, you know? And I, um, I just, somehow it really impacted me. Um, obviously, I mean, I'm a mom. I'm, I, I could put myself in that situation. So um, it just seemed, 
it, it opened my eyes to there needs to be better regulation of that and more more done for communities that don't have the the need the means I guess um, I'm not articulating it very well but it was impactful Thank you. Um, and you know, um, as a lifelong Newark native, um, I know that particularly, I'm sure it happens in other places, but I know in Newark, there have been conversations for decades um, after the 1967 race riots in Newark um, with what was called the white flight um, from the city. There have been for decades conversations about people who serve the city and the people of uh, the city of Newark, but then go home to their families in other places. Um, and so, uh, actually, current Mayor uh, Ross Baraka, um, he uh, has established initiatives to try to bring people back into the city. Um, and so I think that's part of the challenge is that, you know, trying to attract people to a city and to increase economic um, productivity and the, um, and the arts and, you know, within the city. However, at the same time, people knowing that they could be faced with certain infrastructural problems. It's kind of a chicken, chicken and egg uh, issue where um, people, how do you attract people to live in, and to contribute to a particular municipality, but also live there and feel like they're part of a community. Um, at the same time, knowing that for a long time, while in that process, there could be uh, uh, infr um, frustrations caused by the existing infrastructure. So it is, uh, that for me actually was a very thought provoking, um, probably the most thought provoking uh, uh, chapter uh, and story within the book for me as well. You know, uh, Ms. Ms. Houston, how I really appreciate your, um, you know, your reaction, your reflection to that chapter. Uh, that's actually something that I think about a lot, um, even as a medical student. I remember when I was a third year medical student, um, you know, I had a patient on my ob gyn rotation, a uh, Black mother, a single parent who was scared and frustrated at the system because here in Wyandotte County, just to kind of bring it back home, uh, the maternal fetal mortality rate is twice that of white women. And, you know, we think to ourselves, how do we not have the infrastructure? KU Health System is huge, the largest employer in the state of Kansas, yet we still have these disparities. Um, so it just kind of gives you a moment to stop and reflect at, you know, what are the things that are causing this to happen? What is it in our system that prevents us from addressing these disparities um, more efficiently and more absolutely? Uh, because twice the rate, or we can diff we can characterize it also as 200% higher. So, you know, um, you know, I often think about these things, what's contributing to this? And, you know, in my own personal experience with that patient, um, she, I was, I'm pretty sure she was aware of these statistics because, you know, she wasn't my patient at first. She was actually um, a different colleagues of mine who's a pa uh, patient. And, um, you know, they were having a hard time connecting with her. She seemed frustrated. She seemed difficult they labeled her as like a difficult patient or somebody who was curt. And, you know, in reality, it was just like a lack of understanding of her own personal context. And when you go to this patient and speak to her and try to get on her level and give her the time of day and, and don't just dismiss her as somebody who um, might be frustrated or might be difficult to communicate with, you can really start to peel back the layers and see, you know, this is a scared person. This is a mom who knows the reality of a broken health system. And so, um, yeah, I think that that's an excellent chapter. Um, and, and, you know, this stuff exists beyond new work. It exists in our own backyard. And, uh, you know, there's work to be done everywhere. So I appreciate you sharing that. Did anyone else learn anything um, or, or have a reframing of any ideas um, for after reading this book or through reading the book? Um, I'm going back to the, I, I guess what I thought of too was how hard we talked about. Is Kim, if you could oh, please so unmute yourself. For some reason, we're not able to hear you. Now, can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, I just I felt like it must really be hard for him to with his family situation and his sister and 
I just keep going back to the fact that it was difficult for him to be in that environment in Newark with his family and his friends and his close connections. And gosh, that must be really hard. But at the same time, I thought he's a gift to them. I mean, he is, besides treating the people that he's invested in and the community that he's invested in, you know he had to have been mentoring other physicians alongside him, sort of like Kai was saying. You know, Kai was working with a colleague that wasn't quite getting this patient, but I would imagine that when the patient switched to Kai, there was maybe kind of a teaching moment there too. So I've got to think that that he all besides the difficulty, it was also transformative for that community. And, and there's um there's a colleague that I follow on. LinkedIn, he, he's a Mizzou grad from med school, but he has written several books, children's books, and he's recently done a documentary called um, Black Men in White Coats. I don't know if you all have heard of that, but basically it's, it's, it's about having more um, doctors of color, not just black men, but he targets black men because that is a huge population of people that are dying because of the health disparities. And he, he posits that if there are more doctors of color out there uh, treating patients and then also mentoring their colleagues, it would be better for all of us and would keep people from dying. And I've, I've got to think that that's part of what happened with the people working around him. It's also interesting to think, um, you know, for example, as someone from Newark, sometimes I don't realize how impactful the stories can be, whereas clearly they are because, you know, Dr. Davis has been on Oprah, he's received Essence, um, like, you know, awards from Essence. And so I think there's something to be said about the fact that he's received so much attention and acclaim for the work that he's done, um, that it is important work and that people can see that, that indeed, Ms. Hewitt, that um, these are very, very important things that need address. Yeah, I, I really think that it wasn't really like an aha moment, more of like connection. Um, as a patient myself who has an autoimmune disease, I've been uh, in that position where I've had, um, un I've had under insurance. Um, and it was actually at KU Med uh, where I had to go in for an emergent procedure. And I was kind of, I wasn't scared of my doctors, like in the book uh, with some of these patients, but I was, you know, scared of the, 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 costs that go with that. Um, but <clears throat> KU Med has a really excellent uh, patient assistance program. And if only that was like an, an ability for us to like educate our patients, like, okay, you don't have this kind of, you may be underinsured, but there are still services that we can help with. And I was really fortunate to receive that, that assistance program. Uh, I, I, I guess I'm, maybe I'm a little lucky, um, but I do think that in rural uh, Montana, uh, there, I see a lot of, uh, um, Native American populations and there aren't a whole lot of community clinics in Montana. So a lot of these patients, either because of like, we've talked about education and, uh, medical competence, um, or that, you know, um, a lot of them do have Medicaid and Medicare, um, or it, uh, Native American insurance, um, they go to the ER for a regular, a regular um, follow-up visit or even a, just a, a family medicine uh, appointment. And, and that's something that we see actually like in the, in the Blackfeet Native American reservation. So uh, I see that where the demand is very high and we're almost taking these, I, I, I don't want to say it in a bad way, but it's like in the book where he talked about how it's just putting a lot of load and we're taking these resources away from maybe patients that do have emergent uh, conditions and the emergency room is seeing people who we could see in community clinics. Thank you, Ms. Hewitt has actually in the chat for anyone interested has uh, posted some links and information about Black Men in White Coats, the foundation, as well as the trailer uh, for, the, um, for the film. 
thank you for that. Did anyone have any questions or frustrations that kept returning to your mind as you read the book? Or any questions, frustrations, any outstanding questions also at the end of the book that you might have had? When you say frustrations, what do you mean? Um, you know, frustrations with, uh, it could be related to like, you know, frustrated at, at the way this healthcare system is set up or, you know, um, uh, for example, there was a patient story where there was, um, forget the name of the individual, but there was a patient story where um, someone had come in emergently for gunshot, um, uh, uh, gunshot wounds, and um, there were scars indicating that they had previously done an exploratory laparotomy previously. And when they looked in that patient's chart, he had been in previously for a gunshot wound, someone that kept returning for the same kinds of socioeconomic um, issues, um, you know, over and over again. And in this case, like, for example, for me, that was a You're muted again, Shadia. Sorry about that. My uh, the uh, button is the uh, anyway. Um, but so for me, that was a frustrating story because um, uh, and it happens more often than I think many of us would think, where somebody might return to the streets. Um, so for me, that was frustrating, and and you know, wondering, for example, why what is it that we can do to prevent these things, or how can we get um, uh, how can we produce programs uh, that can um, actually impact these individuals. I see that some of the solutions are, are quite easy and you just need to make them more available. Um, making students you know, helping them figure out applications to school and figuring out how do you get a, a um, scholarship, how do you apply for those and just making that kind of information available, connecting people with mentors. Um, yeah, and finding ways to make, make school and education work. I mean, I, the last, I used to teach high school math and last time I taught there was a, a child in the neighborhood had been murdered and students in my class felt like it was some of their neighbors that did it. And, you know, for a month or more, there was a lot of buzz in the classroom about um, the murder happened in an empty field and my students had to walk through that field to get from home to school and back. And so rightfully so, they were, you know, concerned and nervous about, man, am I next? Um, it made, it made learning in school hard. And we had to adjust some things to, to deal with that. But um, there's a lot that people go through and um, those kind of things impact even education. But I think getting a good education um, helps. Since you're talking about education, um, I actually, well, I have a lot of aha moments in this in this book, but um, I can think back to uh, when uh, I was in high school. I was somewhat like him, um, and I can remember being a straight A student. But uh, I often hit that per se to maintain a sense of coolness, et cetera, and I also play sports and other things as well. But uh, but I mean, uh, but I, but he did talk about. The education. He did talk about how, um, you know, one of his friends were able to kind of come about this scholarship opportunity for him and, you know, Ramik and all of them to kind of go to Seton Hall and then go to Robert Woods, et cetera. So those things are out there. Um, but I just think that mentorship is very, very important. I mean, personally, I did not have one. Um, I think I, I had a group of friends, someone like him, that we all kind of pushed, pushed ourselves internally while still being able to function within a school system um, that does not always uh, 
prioritized per se straight A's because um, I went to public school, et cetera. So, um, you know, but I'm just kind of piggybacking on what you're talking about. I remember kind of, you know, you know, you've been a teacher in the public school system, et cetera, and murders, et cetera. But, uh, but yeah, so education is very important. Um, there are a lot of barriers, not only whether they be from a family standpoint, I mean, do they have electricity? I mean, what are they able to eat? You know, if you pay attention to what's going on now in regards to COVID, I mean, one of the biggest issues in some of these major cities are not just getting, getting the kids back into the school system, is they are depending on breakfast, lunch, and that is their nutrition for the day. Um, so there are so many different facets that go into um, just the uh, social and economic aspect to health disparities. But uh, yeah, that's very important. Uh, Dr. Brown, um, actually something interesting about that, um, for me as a child, uh, if we're talking about like people depending on or, or relying on uh, school to provide lunch meals to children, um, it's interesting because um, the first time I had ever seen anyone pay for uh, a school lunch was actually in third grade. So I had gone kindergarten, first, second grade, you know, essentially three years without ever seeing anyone paying for lunch, um, which um, I guess it shows you uh, how how much I didn't even know that was a that was a thing, um, and so it shows you uh, how much um, people can rely on on uh, school and, and any social network um, for those kinds of supports, non educational um, supports that are um, vital to a child's success. I think one of my biggest frustrations throughout reading the book was the healthcare system and how, and I can't remember who had said it at the beginning, but kind of where you live can determine the kind of healthcare that you may be able to access um, or depending on your social economic status, the quality of healthcare that you may be able to access. And I just wish there was a, in a perfect world, a quick fix that um, your health and your life doesn't have to be put on the line because of where you're at in the world or um, that everyone should have this right to quality um, healthcare when they need it, um, before they need it, um, kind of those um, first level kind of things like scans and screenings and all of that. And I just found it frustrating that we live in this world where some people are going to lose their life because they are living in a different area or don't have insurance. Um, there is a period of time this year while we live, um, I live in Johnson County and have access to um, so many like great areas for healthcare, but there was a period of time where we were between like insurances, like we lost our COBRA insurance and the kind of but luckily for me, um, I'm, I don't need as much care, but some of my family members um, are high risk for a lot of stuff. Um, and my youngest sister is going without this time where she doesn't have health insurance and, you know, something happens. She had emergency brain surgery and we had no insurance. So there's that impact of like, well, we still had to get it done, but now we have $36,000 that have to be paid off. And for some people, like they weren't gonna be able to get to the hospital or they weren't gonna be able to ever afford that. And there's those things where it's like your life's on the line because of how different health cares are set up. And um, I think there's a lot that's also just goes around in my brain when I think about our healthcare system and how amazing it is, but all of the um, other parts that are negatively affected. So, um, it's also kind of hard to articulate as well. Um, but I did really appreciate that Dr. Davis um, went above and beyond, I feel like, what his, the definition of what his role is as a doctor. He would try to help his friend get into rehab. Um, he tried to um, relate to a lot of his patients um, and he tried or he met, mentored that girl who failed um, her first test and helped her get through there. So he, I feel like he went above and beyond his role. And we don't always see that in the healthcare role either. So 
those are just like little things. Overall, the book left a very um, positive, I guess I should say the book overall left me um, feeling like I had a little bit more insight to areas that I didn't grow up um, as situations I didn't grow up in. So it allowed me to kind of um, learn and have crucial conversations with myself and in here and hearing what you guys are saying, we're all from different backgrounds. So that was kind of the frustrations I had, but overall it was a learning opportunity as well. Thank you so much. Um, I got a private direct message about uh, from, from one of our participants, it's actually quite thought provoking. Um, I think something that this person had found extremely thought provoking and also frustrating um, in, within medicine and healthcare settings in general, uh, we've shifted away from talking about cultural um, competency to having cultural humility, um, which, and I, I can agree with that personally. Um, I think th the frustration that this person expressed to me um, and, and what they find thought provoking is, the idea of maintaining cultural humility and, uh, and an understanding with underserved and underrepresented patients, but how is it that we can do that while also convincing um, certain patient populations, for example, not to use witchcraft or folk medicine, um, that those are not actual solutions to, um, uh, um, um, usually not new solutions to uh, health ailments. So I, I, I just wanted to pose it all to you as, a, as an idea that was shared um, with me in a, through a direct message. I think that's some kind of, um, somewhat kind of difficult. I think just from a provider perspective, um, you don't want to insult, I, I guess you could say, um, the patient thoughts um, and and or how they would choose to treat certain ailment, ailments or illness. But I think you do have that obligation um, to at least educate on, you know, the appropriate way, the, the, the standard of care per se. Um, because yeah, every once in a while, I mean, I can only speak for myself. I have seen uh, a couple of times where uh, patients have come in with various ailments or issues acutely because they have chosen some alternate form of therapy. And now they have, you know, acute kidney injury, liver injuries, et cetera. Um, so I think, um, you know, I work primarily in the inpatient setting. So most of mine are going to be more of the traditional aspects, but a few times in which I have uh, encountered patients that pre preferred alternate uh, methods. Um, you know, I try my best not to in any kind of way um, negate what they chose to do um, and try to kind of meet them halfway, if, if that makes sense. Um, some met me halfway, some did not. Those did not, you know, you still have to kind of support their wishes the best way they can while still providing them with the necessary medical literature and or potential options for treatment. So, um, you know, I'm not quite sure how much they would see that in the outpatient setting. Um, but if you really think about it, I mean, with general basic medical issues, high blood pressure, I mean, unless it's grossly abnormal, I mean, the first line therapy is weight loss, exercise, diet, et cetera um diabetes same thing so now again that then kind of creates that same social economic issue that you have where you know do they have a whole foods next door um do they have um what are the restaurants like i mean do they live in a neighborhood where all they have is fast food so that kind of can create its own issues or its own discussion um but uh, but yes i think you should have that humility you should always um try to meet them halfway. I personally always start off by asking patient and or families, you know, what are your questions? What are your concerns? What are your thoughts? So therefore they are speaking first. I allow them to lead the conversation so you can better, you know, assess how you then want to um, govern yourself and how you want to manage the situation. But I think uh, having a sense of respect and humility for the patient, that can go a long way. I, I think, Dr. Brown, thank you so much for the commentary I, or, or the, those tips. I think that actually, 
as I'm hearing you say these things, my head, like the, the wheels are turning and I'm thinking to myself, oh, wow, these are actually, these approaches that you're suggesting are actually applicable to all kinds of situations, not just in patient care. You know, it can be in any setting that we can apply that to. So thank you. Uh, as we wrap up, we have about 10 minutes left. Uh, I just wanted to um, highlight a comment by Miss Olivia, a statistics student. Uh, um, she uh, has not read yet, but she has um, heard that there's a book called Medical Apartheid or Apartheid or Medical, Medical Apartheid um, that uh, discusses understanding discomfort and distrust of the medical system and how we can communicate with uh, people, uh, 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 patients that come from different um, backgrounds and have different um, belief systems. Um, and I would also like to um, ask, are there any like final comments or um, I guess wanting to leave on a positive note, were there any stories that impacted you in a positive way? For example, for me, I, uh, I felt um, I was, uh, the, the story, um, I think Ms. Rochelle had mentioned, um, the story about the student had failed step one, what's arguably the most important um, uh, licensing exam for medical students or physicians. Um, I found that to be um, a very positive story because he didn't, the, Dr. Davis didn't owe anything to the student, but um, had identified with that situation and wanted to do everything in his power to help her succeed. So for me, that was something positive that I took away that there are indeed uh, physicians um, who are um, not just serving an underserved community on a service level, but also um, really um, making it their duty to serve, uh, you know, humankind in, in various kinds of ways. I also found that chapter to be really positive. Um, I graduate in May and have my big board exam um, coming scheduled in June. Um, and so just um, realizing, well, not even realizing, but as I was reading that chapter, um, kind of the things that he did to prepare himself and, um, how he knew that he was smart enough to be a doctor and that, um, someone kind of was his mentor to get him to the next step to pass that test the second time. Um, and how he relayed what really helped him focus, um, eliminated some of those stressors, the negative thoughts he was having and it allowed him to take that test and pass um, kind of resonated with me to hold on to as I'm approaching that time where studying is happening a lot, applying for jobs um, and that big board exam is coming up. So that was definitely a chapter that I found very um, positive as well and resonated with me as I'm getting those jitters for the exam and am I going to be um, prepared enough, smart enough, um, ready to pass it to become a practitioner, a future practitioner. So um, I thought that chapter was um, really great as well. You are plenty smart. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, any final thoughts before we transition? I know we have a few minutes before everyone has to return to um, uh, back to their uh, work duties or, or about their day. I uh, also wanted to remind you that next week, March 3rd, Dr. Sampson Davis will be giving the endowed uh, a Peter T. Bo Peter D. Bo excuse me, Peter T. Bohan, uh, MD, uh, endowed lecture. So he will be here um, virtually with the KUMC community giving a lecture. I look forward to, to seeing that. But yeah, I agree with everyone. Um, you know, I think uh, for me, just kind of reading through each chapter, you know, for, I would say most of the chapters I had some sort of, I can relate to and or personally and or with work. So um, I think uh, he really did try to not just speak to the people, but also relate to some of his own um personal um how can i pay how can i say it um bears that he had to overcome and i liked how he emphasized that you know just to make it whatever you decide to do in life whether it be occupational therapy medical school it doesn't matter you know it really does you really do need that community and or someone to kind of help you along along the way so um i think uh that was kind of one of the the good points uh without me 
getting too much into uh, some of the other chapters uh, specifics, but uh, yeah, it was a good book. So hello everyone, I'm Monica Curlow. I'm a neuro rehabilitation psychologist um, in the departments of psychiatry and rehab medicine. I just wanna say thanks for letting me lurk uh, a little bit. Mm -hmm. I apologize, I was eating lunch at the same time and I didn't want you guys to have to mm -hmm. watch me eat lunch. Um, but I wanna say thank you very much actually for um, uh, having us read this book in particular, and also for this discussion. Shadia, you did a very nice job leading us in the discussion. Thank you. So much. Um, and we appreciate that. Um, and Dr. Brown, I appreciate your mentorship of our, of, of our students and all the great work that you do. Um, I wanna say I liked this book so much that I read it uh, so fast. I don't remember all the specific stories, unfortunately. Um, but um, I, what kind of resonates with me is, um, first of all, that I wonder what it would be like if he wrote an update to this book with some pieces of understanding of experiences now that we've uh, been in this COVID pandemic and how that might look different um, or sound different um, or maybe not. Um, and I, I also want to encourage um, you students um, and, and Dr. Brown um, mm -hmm. and, and some of us faculty too, um, to consider writing about our own experiences because I think the, the power comes from the word and listening and hearing about experiences. And I know all of our experiences are very different. Um, I grew up a block and a half from the emergency room of our, um, uh, local hospital, but it was in Davenport, Iowa. That's very, very, very different than Newark, New Jersey, obviously. So, um, uh, so I know my experience is different than everyone else's experience here. I just want to acknowledge that all of our stories have value, and I really hope that you consider sharing your stories with others so that others can really hear and gain from your insight, just like we've learned and gained from Dr. Davis's insight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's a powerful reminder for all of us. Ms. Michaela, did you want to take it away? Any final comment? I just want to say thank you all so much for particip participating. Also, thank you for moderating Shadia and Dr. Brown. Um, I think this discussion was really great and it was really great to get a lot of different departments together. Um, I hope you can all join us for the Zoom discussion or the Zoom lecture next Wednesday at the same time. Um, if not, I'm sure it will be recorded and found online. Um, and if you have any questions please um, about the lecture, please let me know or about this discussion. I have taken all of your recommendations in the chat and I'll add them to our list to review books for next year. Um, but thank you. I hope you all have a wonderful Wednesday and enjoy the sunshine we're getting. All righty. It was a pleasure, everyone. Thank you. Bye, right, everyone. Bye -bye. Thank you.